In the spirit of uh, getting everyone to the reception on time, I think we're going to get started. <laughs> uh, my, my name is Tom Tepper. I'm the Associate Dean for Collections and Technical Services at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And I'm joined by my colleague, Bill Michaud, who's the head of our Granger Engineering Library and Information Center, as well as holder of our Berthold Professorship. And we're here to talk about the shadow acquisitions budget, APCs and open access publications at a research university. So before we go on, a little bit of con a little bit of context. Uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign is a comprehensive land-grant institution. We have almost 50,000 total students. Uh, at this point, almost going on 15,000 graduate students and almost 1,900 faculty members. Our ICR income on campus in 2017 was $138 million. And our sponsored research in that same year was $462 million. That's just for that campus, not the whole system at this point in time. <coughs> yeah. In terms of scholarly communications on campus and what's been happening with that, some of you may be aware that in about 2013, there was a member of our state legislature that actually tried to pass a resolution say, stating that all research at state institutions needed to be made open access, uh, regardless of the type, book, journal, et cetera. Um, that, that didn't go very far. And, and actually, the, the research universities in the state worked with that legislature to draft, legislator to draft <coughs> a new piece that, that, that changed the tone a little bit. And it went in the direction of requiring each campus to complete a study and begin drafting an open access policy and passing one of those. So we have an open access policy that was passed in 2016. It's very similar to the policy that the University of California system operates under. Now, the library has strong partnerships with Campus Research Administration as well. The Illinois Experts is our faculty profiling service. That is actually run out of the university library, as is the Illinois Data Bank. Um, and in the spirit of walking the walk, you know, I recently put a data set in there for a forthcoming publication, uh, went through those steps, and it's been downloaded 30 times in the last two months. It's, I, I don't know why. It's not that, that riveting. Um, <clears throat> but in the library, we have a fair amount of support for open access overall. Uh, our campus provided some of the leadership for the policy development itself. We've, we've been heavily engaged in open digitization activities. Uh, we've supported acquisitions related OA and scholarly communications efforts like Scope 3, Archive, and Knowledge Unlatched. And we have a developing publishing program. We have, however, no history of any direct support for APCs, either at the <laughs> library or the, the campus research administration level. And, and it's a little bit interesting, and one might wonder why. Uh, in part, I think it stems from the financial situation in Illinois for a few years. Uh, you, you may recall we, we had a bit of a dip. Uh, we had no budget for three years, I think it was, in the state. Um, and, and there's also been a bit of a skeptical view of APCs, especially when it comes to commercially commercial publishers and their, their, their support for open access publishing. You know, were we going to just create another revenue stream for these, for these uh, publishers? So we've really refrained from being engaged in that activity. About 12 to 18 months ago, Bill and I started having some conversations. And, and that's, that, those conversations are really the root of where some of this, this work comes from. We started talking about uh, various things like, or various issues like, how much does Illinois pay in subvention fees? How would we begin tracking that or figuring that out if we wanted to? Uh, what, are, what are the opportunity costs for the institution in paying some of those fees? And should we be trying to look at those in some way? And, and rather than go through all of these, what I think we can do is start turning to, to, to Bill's portion where we go through the methodology a little bit and can begin talking about some of the findings. 
I think we can get back to some of these questions uh, uh, as we go through the, uh, the methodology, as Tom mentioned. Um, so uh, I, mean, I think it's really important for us to know, to be better informed about uh, OA um, activities on our campus. And this is useful now, particularly now, since we have the Plan S and we have the OA 2020 program and Pay It Forward. We, there's a lot of talk about a gold APC-based model for publishing. Um, I think this is also useful as we negotiate contracts. There's been a lot of uh, uh, concern, uh, uh, a lot of activity around negotiating contracts where uh, the portion of articles that a particular institution is uh, contributing offsets the cost of the uh, subscription. So you, you sometimes see this term offsetting or offsets. Uh, it's, it's also another important element as we go through the contract negotiations with particular publishers. So there's been a number of studies that try to figure out how much percent, what percent of the literature is OA. Some of the older studies are really methodologically flawed. Um, but there's been two or three studies, which I've listed here in the last couple of years. Uh, Science Metrics was funded by NSF to actually try to make an estimate of, of the amount of uh, articles that are being published that are open access or percent of the literature that's OA. Uh, they found that at least 50% of the articles became available in OA within 12 to 18 months. That's probably a little high uh, based on what, we, what we're saying. Uh, nice article in PRJ in 2018, which actually tried to calculate this in three different ways and found a, a, a wide range of percentage of articles that were open access or papers that were open access. Another article in 2018 in Journal of Infometrics uh, where they actually looked at Google Scholar and uh, found that 54% were open access. Uh, what we found was something sort of in between also. Um, again, I want to mention these open access initiatives. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Plan S. That's uh, a very hot topic right now in all the listservs. Uh, actually, kind of based on this OA 2020, uh, um, started out as European projects, kind of been embraced by California and other places. But a lot of gold open access uh, uh, around APC costs. Um, a lot of universities, including us, have invested a lot in gold OA, and we're trying to measure these frequencies at UIUC. And I think we're a pretty good representative of, of a typical R1 institution. Uh, we have a, a less strong program in biomedical and uh, uh, medical, although we're just starting a new medical school, so that's going to that's going to go up. Uh, we have a very strong program in physical sciences and engineering, and social sciences, where a lot of the OA activity is. Uh, all right, so the thing that's changed, I think, recently is that we finally have in place the tools and the services that kind of let us do this. I want to show us, I'm going to show you one way that we actually try to calculate uh, OA activity uh, longitudinally, but you can do this with other types of systems. Uh, we used uh, our local SciVal Pure database. How many people have Pure here? Like a handful. Pure has a couple of nice ways to download the metadata. One is their API, which is really not very good. But there's another way where you literally can download the metadata into spreadsheets, and we took the spreadsheets, converted them into databases, relational databases, so we can do SQL queries over them. So we took our SciVal Pure database, which was uh, from 2013 to mid-2018 when we did the study, it's a few months ago, uh, and pulled out 37,000 papers or articles or book chapters or books. From those 37,000, we determined that 27,000 were articles, journal articles. We excluded erratum, letters, and editorials. Uh, so, uh, um, and after we did that, we were left with the 27,000. Uh, so this is 72.9% of all the publications. Uh, we're getting about 5,000 articles a year that our, our faculty are publishing, which I think is typical for a lot of the institutions that are sort of at our level, uh, R1 level. So we're pulling out metadata, which includes the title, author, ISSN, EISN and DOI. DOI is extremely important. DOI is kind of the coin of the realm now. Uh, we can use DOIs in a lot of different API services, and I'll show you how we're doing this here, um, uh, to, to extract information and make comparisons. Uh, we use APIs a lot in our discovery system. Uh, so then we took the, downloaded the DOAJ database, although we also use their API, and Ulrich's uh, uh, open access, or pulled the open access records out of Ulrich's, uh, and then we started doing, uh, looking to see how many of these are open access. So, from the 27,000 articles, 
We searched the uh, ISSN, EISSN title against Ulrichs to get the gold and DOAJ to get the gold uh, OA articles. DOAJ is a directory of open access journals. It has about 11,000 titles in it. Then we also searched the article DOI against Unpaywall, the Unpaywall API, to determine OA availability. Uh, Unpaywall lets you send a DOI to it and it'll come back and tell you what, if there is an open access version of that article and actually what the best open access version is. Uh, <coughs> Unpaywall gives uh, the typical gold and green uh, OA matches, uh, also the hybrid matches and what they call bronze OA, <laughs> the bronze OA type. Bronze OA is uh, uh, an open access article from a journal that's typically behind a paywall. So it's typically not a uh, open access journal. Uh, they may not even allow hybrid uh, uh, payments for articles, uh, but they're making the article open for one reason or another. Some of these uh, come and go, and, which is one of the problems with uh, uh, using those. So then we also recorded, looked up the APC charges by looking at uh, uh, DOAJ database, which has uh, the APC charge. Max Planck has a nice uh, website that lists all the OA uh, APCs. And then what's cut off here, we actually all even looked at the journal website in some cases to try to figure out the, OA, the APC cost. Uh, again, we did not, uh, this is important, we just took these base APC costs. We didn't prorate for non-Illinois co-authorship. <clears throat> we didn't uh, try to calculate additional, we had no additional charges. Some journals, if you want color prints, still charge extra for page charges. Uh, didn't differentiate between the faculty and grad students. Uh, didn't make any time adjustment for uh, a moving wall or embargo period. Although you see, we'll, you'll see when you, we show a chart later that you can see the articles that are a few years old, a higher percentage, percentage of them are open access. Uh, one important thing is, uh, I've talked to a couple of faculty members recently, these APC charges are typically paid, what I understand from talking to two faculty members, is that the APC charges are paid by the corresponding author. So in many cases, uh, our, one of our authors or one of our faculty is the corresponding author, and they paid the APC charge. Uh, so they're not typically divided between institutions. In fact, one institution pays the charges. All right, here's uh, some of the numbers. So when we look at this database of 27,000 articles published between 2013, mid-2018, 13% are in gold OA journals. So 13%, which is a little bit lower than what you would expect, although, again, these are not individual articles. They're at the journal level. And there were a total of 409 different gold journals. So uh, there's a long tail. 205 of them had one article only. So there, there's a bunch at the top where we're publishing in a lot, and a bunch from the middle on down that our faculty are only publishing at one time over five years. Uh, remember, Gold OA does not uh, uh, require that the, uh, the article, the, the publisher charge an uh, APC, an author processing charge. Gold OA, by definition, just means that the article is available free uh, from the publisher website. However, only nine of the top 100 did not charge APCs. Four of them were journals that are in scope three, and we'll talk about that later. So there are really only five journals of the top 100 that are people published in that are not charging APCs. So there's very few free lunches, very few of uh, these gold OA journals uh, that aren't charging uh, author processing or article processing charge. We add up all the uh, APC charges from these 409 different journals, uh, comes to about $5 million over the uh, t five years, basically, 2013 to uh, mid-2018. Average APC article charge is $1,511, just doing the average. Uh, this compares very favorably with a, a quote of $1,825 for Research One universities uh, that was derived in the uh, Don't uh, Pay It Forward project. Uh, scope three, uh, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, CERN negotiates the tenders offers to 11 high energy physics journals. We all contribute to that, or the libraries that used to subscribe to those journals. Uh, we actually had 569 articles published in those journals in 2013 to 2018. We have a very active high energy physics program at the University of Illinois. This may be uh, different at your institution. It's the one area that we may be specializing in that some 
R1 universities or not. Uh, our assessment for uh, scope three last year was $10,203. It's come down over the last five years. But if you figure this over five years, it only averages $88 an article. At $1,500 an article, we'd be paying 900 k So uh, the scope three model for OA is very inexpensive. Right now, it's only high energy physics that has this model. It's a lot of work for CERN to do this. They're basically collecting this money and, and negotiating with publishers uh, for how much uh, they're going to give them. Uh, gold LA percent by year. Uh, you can see uh, this is kind of interesting. This kind of peaked in 2015. It's going down a little bit. Um, this is a little misleading also in that these are the pure dates of loading, not necessarily publication dates. Uh, so that may even out, but that may actually be a factor. Um, this actually reflects something that we've been told by faculty uh, where they are uh, getting concerned about uh, APC charges because their discretionary funds are sinking. Uh, uh, more ICR money is being taken off of grants, um, and they're concerned about that. Hope people can see this. This is really the list of the top OA journals. So the highest on the list is PLOS One, Public Library of Science One. This is their uh, peer review light journal. They publish about 25,000 to 30,000 articles a year on PLOS One. They charge $1,495 per article. Uh, very interesting in that a couple years ago, I talked to the College of Engineering department heads and they said uh, basically that uh, they would not accept articles for promotion and tenure that were done in peer review light journals like PLOS One or uh, uh, APS advances or uh, other uh, journals. Uh, Tripoli also has one. Last year I talked to a faculty member who said, yes, they were looking at them now if they were cited heavily. So there's still uh, a, a bit of a prejudice against these peer review light journals, but that's changing. And you can see we have a lot of articles being published in plus one. The, uh, two of the other top five here are, are high energy physics journals. So we have 243 articles in Journal of High Energy Physics, and that is one that's under the scope three process. Uh, if you go down and look at Nature Communications, which is 100, 600, 164 articles, that charges $5,200 per article. So altogether in the last five years, we've put $852,000 into Nature Communications, the campus has, from grants or from discretionary funds. Because as Tom mentioned, library's not paying for any of that. Office of the Vice Chancellor of Research is not paying. Maybe some departments are. Uh, so very interesting. Uh, again, if Nature would have come to us five years ago and said we got a new journal that we want to charge you $110,000 a year for, uh, I think our answer would have been that's very difficult for us to understand. But yet we are paying that kind of money as a campus of this. Um, down here to the next 16. Uh, at 35, we're down to 16 articles published over the five-year uh, period. Uh, you can see a lot of these are in the $2,000 range. Uh, cell reports is $5,000. Uh, interesting one in the middle here, number 23, is Chemical Science, which is the new ACS journal, which charges no APC fees. Uh, but it's very difficult to get an article accepted in that. Uh, we've had 23 articles uh, accepted in that journal. That's the only one really in the top 30 here, uh, other than the scope threes that do not charge APC. How are we doing for time? Very good. Hope you're saving up your questions. Uh, now, so that's so these are the gold OA journals. Most of them who charge article processing charges. That's 13 percent. Now we went back and looked at, at all of the articles again, the 27,000, to see how many of them were open access by checking them against unpaywall. Uh, there were a number of them. I can't. I don't remember the exact number where we didn't have DOIs. So we actually went into Crossref, wrote another script that searched uh, Crossref to try to pull out the DOI. That brought back another thousand or so. Uh, but uh, the universe here is less than 27,000. It's about 25,800 articles that we have, articles and DOIs associated with them. So we looked those up in Unpaywall and found that about 41% of all the articles were available in an OA version, either a Gold OA version green, like for example, at an institutional repository, uh, hybrid where it was at the publisher site but the author paid to make the article open access, or in this bronze category. So that 40.9% or 41% compares very favorably what we're seeing in the literature. Uh, if you look at uh, on paywall themselves saying it's between 27 and 47, 
Uh, Google Scholar study showing 54. The uh, uh, site metrics study showing about 50 percent. So it, it means that of all the, of the articles in our SciVal pure uh, instantiation uh, implementation, 40.9, 41 percent of them are open access and available free of charge. We've added the unpaywall API into our discovery system. So if you look at our Bento-based discovery system at Illinois, you'll see what we call open access links. These are links that uh, we've got from unpaywall by looking up the article DOI uh, uh, in the person's results set uh, against the unpaywall database. And we're putting those open access links up in addition to the paywall links. Uh, I should also say there are some problems with the bronze unpaywall data. So this 41% is, is an estimate, or it, it, it's a, an accurate figure based on the unpaywall database, but there are some mistakes in the unpaywall database, particularly some of these bronze articles that were open access for a short period of time, complementary basis or introductory basis, may no longer be open access, but they still show up in the database. Uh, we've done some manual checking of that and found a, uh, some of them. Uh, but then there are some things also that not, are not in DOAJ and not are in paywall. Uh, DLive magazine, for example, isn't in either one, and those are open access articles, obviously. Uh, so this is representative, this is the Illinois numbers. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's representative of the uh, R1 institutions. Uh, same thing here for the goal OA. You'll see the percentages kind of peaked in 2015 and 2016. Uh, and I'm sorry, this is the all OA, and uh, it's going to be going down a little bit. All right, so this is our last slide, actually. Um, this kind of repeats some of the questions that we, uh, that we have in the um, uh, uh, Tom's second slide. So we need to duplicate, duplicate the study at other institutions or expand this. I mean, we could try to do this with all the BTAA, Big Ten Academic Alliance, uh, 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 institutions and see what the differences are. Be a good test in terms of uh, uh, differing uh, uh, disciplinary emphases at the different BTAA institutions. Again, we've got these tools now, so uh, this can be done not only from SciVal Pure, but it can be done from a Web of Science database if you had, or, or even a journal list of all the uh, articles that were published by an institution or a Scopus database. We've done a lot with the Scopus API and on Paywall API also. Um, so uh, we mentioned one other thing. I, I think I mentioned earlier that um, we were getting some pushback. Uh, recently, we talked to a couple of faculty members uh, in our medical school, actually, who have been very active in terms of publishing. A couple of them have published a lot of articles, a number of those 164 articles in Nature uh, communications, uh, and, th and they're getting a little upset. I mean, th this is something they brought up at the campus level. It's something that needs to be discussed. Um, one person said, well, if I publish three articles in Nature Com, that's actually one less grad student I can hire to actually do real work. Uh, uh, you're, you're cutting my discretionary money. You're, you're, you're taking more e ICR off. Uh, my uh, grants are, are uh, very tight. Uh, we don't have this kind of money. So this is a question I think a lot of institutions are going to have to address in the next couple of years. Is, uh, particularly if we go to a Plan S model or OA 2020 model where we're focusing on gold OA, somebody's going to have to pay those charges. Uh, one of the things we've talked about is trying to take some money out of the library budget. But again, we don't, I don't think any of us want to be in situations where the library is deciding whether or not to pay somebody else's OA charge. Uh, so if we get 500 people who want to publish in PLOS One, we're not going to be able to, we should not be the arbiters of that to decide who we're going to pay for and who we're not going to pay for. So uh, those are interesting questions. Tom, do you want to say anything more about these questions? Yeah. Well, you know, I think, um, you know, I, certainly that opportunity cost is, is something that's important. You know, I, I'm, I'm struck a little bit by the list of journals that are that is represented. They are very very heavily weighted toward the STEM disciplines, as one would expect. You know, yet yet just the other week, I had a conversation with a colleague in the library who was who had a paper accepted and wanted to in an open access publication and wanted to walk the walk. She she wanted to take that step and. 
one of the challenges she had was you know, a $1,600 bill. Now, she doesn't have grant money to pay that. She does not have that same kind of funding. Mm -hmm. And if you, you create a fund that's going to support this and provide the same level of access to people who have, regardless of whether they have grant money or not, because we want to be equitable in some way, that creates a different challenge because one would anticipate there's going to be a growth in, in non-STEM related publications that are going in this direction. Um, Frankly, the APCs, for those who don't have a lot of grant money, who don't have endowed professorships, et cetera, are probably a, uh, they, they probably turn people off uh, in some disciplines to publishing in an open access model. Um, and we even talked, even talked about uh, faculty in, in developing countries uh, uh, who are a $5,200 bill for nature communications, that might be their research budget for a year. So, so I think one of the, the follow-ups to all of this, though, is, is a need to actually do some qualitative work with some faculty on campus as well to get, to get an idea of how they feel about this and, and have more than just uh, you know, hallway conversations, have some, have some data down about their, their particular feelings. Um, so we have a little over five minutes. Thank you.